Hello, hi, thanks everyone for joining us for another physical review fluids journal club where we get to hear presentations from authors of new physical review fluids articles followed by live discussion. So today we're excited to hear from Pierre Saray from University Lille on the prediction and manipulation of hydrodynamic rogue waves via nonlinear spectral engineering. The presentation will be about 15 minutes or so, and after which Pierre will answer questions. So at that point, you can either put them in the chat or raise your hand, hold the question till the end. Okay, whenever you're ready, you can start here. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much uh, for the editor to organize this uh, a nice uh, journal club. Uh, I, first of all, I would like to say that this work has been done in collaboration uh, with people from different community. So from uh, people from mathematics, Gennadiel and Alex Torbis. I've seen that Alex is here, so I'm happy for the question. And Giacomo Roberti. Uh, people from hydrodynamics, so Felicien Bonnefoy, uh, who is there also, uh, Guillaume Ducrozet, Guillaume Michel, and the group of uh, Eric Falcon, and people uh, such as me from uh, nonlinear wave uh, optics, uh, nonlinear optics, let's say generally, uh, Stéphane Rondou, Francois Copy, uh, myself, and Alexei Chikan, who is here, who is the first author, and he was. Uh, PhD student when we run the experiments and he has uh, done a lot of work on the simulation and uh, data analysis. Uh, do you see my mouse? So I'm sure that it's fine when I will need it. Uh, so uh, first of all, I would like to say something uh, about the, the word uh, rogue wave here. Contrary to some of our previous works and uh, in many works in literature, here, we don't use the word rogue wave with a statistical sense, okay? We use the word rogue wave, uh, just about one current structure, which is, uh, sorry, I have a problem, yes, which is a peregrine soliton. And the peregrine soliton is a well-known uh, exact solution of the one-dimensional nonlinear Schrodinger equation. I will say a word about why in the framework of inverse scattering transform, it's often seen as a soliton interacting with a plane wave. And the central starting idea of this paper uh, come from a mathematical uh, theorem. And this paper is about the observation in deep water wave experiments, deep uh, gravity, gravity wave, uh, the phenomenon described by this mathematical theorem. And this theorem states that the regularization of the gradient catastrophe in the semi-classical limit of uh, one-dimensional non-inon Schrodinger equation uh, uh, end up with the emergence, the local emergence of the peregrine soliton. So don't be afraid about all the mathematical vocabulary that I've put here, because the purpose of my talk is to give you some simple definition to explain you these words, to help you to read the paper, okay? So I will spend some time to introduce you all the framework and all the world that are here. So let's start with the peregrine soliton. So it's a known solution of the one dimensional uh, NLS equation and uh, known since 40 years. And it has been observed more than 10 years ago, uh, both in optical fiber experiments and uh, in deep water experiments. And you have here the, the, the picture of the deep water uh, experiments. And you, you see that you start at the beginning of a one dimensional uh, water tank. You start with a plane wave with a small perturbation. And during the propagation, you have the emergence of these structures that is the peregrine soliton. So I need to, to introduce uh, the what is inverse scattering transform, and I will do it in a very simple word and only in a in, with, with few sentences. If you if you look at integrable equations such as uh, a KDV equation, sine Gordon, or the one dimensional non linear Schrodinger equation, you can exactly solve this equation uh, with a non linear transform. And after this nonlinear transform, you end up with a linear scattering problem. So to solve this linear scattering problem, you look for eigenvalues. And in 
generally, you have a continuous spectrum and discrete spectrum. spectrum. When you have only soliton, you have only a discrete spectrum and all the eigenvalues are complex and they are all by pair with uh, opposite imaginary part. And so I will speak only about the eigenvalues in the upper half plane of the, of the complex plane. And the amplitude of the soliton is proportional to the imaginary part of these eigenvalues. And the velocity of the soliton is proportional to the real part. So I will only use this as a representation of soliton. The remarkable fact is that inverse scattering transform gives you a spectrum that is a constant of motion. So now if we look, this is for zero boundary condition when we look at this soliton. Now, if we look at non-zero boundary condition, you have greater solitons, a greater solution, sorry, uh, that are often seen as solitons on finite background. So it means that the boundary condition are non-zero. And now the inverse scattering transform representation is different. You still have these discrete points that correspond to one soliton and what is called a branch cut, which is in red here, that correspond to the plane wave. So that is the reason why Peregrin soliton is often seen as the interplay between a soliton and a plane wave. So the mathematical theorem I was speaking about has been derived by, by Bertola and Torbis uh, almost 10 years ago in the framework of the semi-classical limit of NLS. So it means that you can uh, write NLS in this form with epsilon that is small. And physically, if you are in the lab, this means that you start with a large initial hump that goes to zero and large mean large in comparison with the size of the soliton. So you can think about this epsilon as the ratio between the size of a soliton and the size of the initial hemp. And what happened, you see it here, is that when you propagate this large initial pulse, you will have a complex dynamics. And the theorem show that the first emergent of the current structures here is the peregrine soliton. So it means that the, the current structure that emerge can be well fitted uh, in the limit. It is uh, uh, locally a peregrine soliton. Okay, it is a picture which is here. So this uh, theorem state that this emergence of the, of the peregrine soliton arise as the regularization of a gradient catastrophe. So I will explain you what it is. You can map nonlinear Schrodinger equation into these two uh, a PDE, okay? And because epsilon is small, at short propagation distance, you can say, okay, I will neglect this term and you end up with a hydrodynamics like uh, model. And if you do numerical simulation just with a hump, what you get, you get that at some point that, that, that is called the gradient catastrophe point C, 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 which is a distance of propagation, the derivative of this variable, which is the intensity and the derivative of U become infinite. This is a gradient catastrophe. And regularization of the gradient catastrophe give rise locally to uh, the rational uh, solution of nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which is the Peregrine's uh, solution. So the theorem give, give us a lot of details, exact details. It, it gives us the value of the gradient catastrophe point the value of the distance of propagation you need to reach the maximum compression point of the peregrine soliton. This is a, a, a constant that is known and epsilon is the epsilon of, of uh, my equation. So a few years ago, we, with uh, the group of John Dudley uh, in, in collaboration with them, we performed experiments in uh, optical fibers to look at this, this uh, dynamical phenomenon. And so we just start from a, a, a pulse. And when you propagate along the fiber, it is what you see, okay? Each column corresponds to a different size of the fiber. You see locally the emergence, the focusing of the large pulse and the emergence of uh, these uh, current structures that is extremely well fitted by the, the peregrine soliton. So in this experiment, there is 
no phase at all. Okay, so it means that the, the chirp is just a, a real one and, and there is a, a no phase. So in the, in the theorem, the interesting point is that now if I add a chirp, so if I add a phase here with mu, which is a chirp parameter with this non-trivial phase, you still have the gradient catastrophe. You still have the regularization with the local emergence of the peregrine. But what changed? It is the point of the gradient catastrophe. So it means that you can change the distance of propagation you need to have the emergence of these current structures. And interestingly, you see that if mu is equal to minus two, the distance of propagation to reach this gradient catastrophe goes toward infinity. So you can uh, push very far the emergence of the, of, uh, the peregrine soliton. And finally, from the conceptual point of view, what is important is that the soliton content of your initial pulse depends on the chirp. So what you can look at, it's the inverse scattering transform. So here you recognize my discrete eigenvalues. They are the soliton content of my initial large hump. You can change the chirp. So you have here the initial chirp, sorry, here the initial chirp, that you put, and you have no discrete eigenvalue. This is for mu equal to. And you see that the spatial temporal evolution of, uh, of, of my wave field look quite similar, but you have changed the distance of propagation you need to observe this peregrine. So let's go to the experimental results now that you have all the vocabulary and the idea. So it's uh, the water tank uh, in Ecole Centrale de Nantes, uh, in which work uh, Félicien Bonnefoy and Guillaume Ducrozet. Uh, we have put uh, gouges every six meters. Uh, we have a wave maker that is uh, plugged uh, to a computer, so we can launch a control initial condition. And we have a beach at the end to avoid uh, reflection at the end of the water tank. So it's a 1D uh, water tank. Just final thing before I show you the results. I am speaking from the beginning about uh, one, uh, 1D uh, NLS. We describe at leading order the deep water waves, but the slow varying amplitude of the deep water wave. So it means that I have a Kai wave and I have a narrow band spectrum with a slow varying amplitude here, and eta is a surface elevation. And I will show you all, also simulation of these two equations. That is a model that starts to take into account the higher order effect than the one that are in nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So here are the main results of the paper. This is the experiments. We change our mu parameter, which is a chirp, okay? And you see that when we change the chirp, we start from a large initial hump and we end up with these coherent structures. And you see that we can change the distance of propagation before reaching the emergence locally of the peregrine soliton by changing our chirp. Uh, at the bottom, you have numerical simulation of NLS. They are perfectly symmetric, okay? And uh, of course, in experiments, because of high order, uh, you have the, the, the spectral downshift and you have this asymmetry and this velocity and you capture this velocity with the dist equation. So we can summarize the results by looking at the point at which we have the emergence of this peregrine soliton at the top of the large hump. Uh, in green, you have the, the, the point of the experiments and you have comparison with numerical simulation and a comparison with the theory. And the difference between experiments and theory arise from the fact that in the experiments, epsilon is not very small, it's only one third. And uh, so you, you would need in the, in the theorem to take into account higher order effect, higher, sorry, higher order terms in, in epsilon, okay? But the, very interestingly, you see that even for quite large epsilon, you, the, the, the phenomenon qualitatively is, is quite robust. I go back to my inverse scattering transform. So these are the experimental uh, surface elevation that you record at the first gauge, okay? So after six meters of propagation, 
we record it. We, we will be transform, we retrieve the slow varying amplitude in black. And so we have the phase and the amplitude. In red, it is the one that is launched in, in simulation. And we can compute inverse scattering transform of this data. So you see that when I change the uh, chirp parameter, I change the number of discrete eigenvalues. So it means that I am changing the soliton content of the initial pulse. And you see that here, uh, for this uh, simulation and experiments, we still have one. And with NLS, we don't have any discrete eigenvalue. It is because of the high order effects that perturb uh, uh, the inverse scattering transform and the soliton content. So the message here is that uh, locally, you can have the peregrine soliton without soliton. Okay, that, that's the, the, the physical uh, uh, idea. So I will try to conclude to have uh, time for question. So I've shown you that we can manipulate raw grave in the sense of coherent structure that is an exact solution of NLS, NLS by changing the chirp of the initial large hump. What we have done is to analyze this in the framework of inverse scattering transform and that the mechanism is robust. So what you get here, it's the evolution from red to blue when you propagate along the water tank of the uh, eigenvalue. You remember I told you, remarkable fact is that they are constant. They are constant in NLS. They are not constant in a real world. So it's one of the nice and interesting and challenging uh, open mathematical question, which is how to try to take into account perturbative effect to describe this small change of the inverse scattering transform eigenvalues. And finally, to conclude, I would like to insist, I didn't show you anything about statistics, but here it's a paper on one dynamical mechanism, but it is an elementary brick which is extremely important to understand the one-dimensional nonlinear random waves. In the past, we have uh, published several papers in which we, we launch random initial conditions. So you can launch any Fourier spectrum that you want. Sometimes uh, people uh, like John Swap spectrum, but what is important that you have randomness at the beginning. And if the, the wave height is large enough, you will, recognize locally this mechanism described by Bertola Torbis uh, theorem. And I recommend for, to understand that uh, you to read the paper of Alexei Tikan in FISREV-E in 2020, in which numerically he show that this mechanism that I've shown you today strongly influence the statistics of the wave and how you can correlate this emergence of the, lo the local peregrine uh, together with this, the, the evolution of the kurtosis, for example. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Pierre, for the presentation. We have plenty of time for questions. Uh, how about, oh, I saw a hand raised. Oh. So I just stopped share because I don't see anything else. <laughs> okay. I will reshare after that. So please raise your hand in the um, in Zoom or and please my course or be ready to answer depending on your speciality. <laughs> and we can also take questions in the chat. Hi, hello. Good morning. Hello. I I, I don't know how to raise my hand here. So. <laughs> okay, go. Please ask your question. <laughs> Yeah, right. Thank you. So uh, uh, thank you for your nice presentation. I would like to understand uh, how, uh, what are the tricks that you do to make the, 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 the gauge uh, uh, not invasive when you probe the waves in the channel? You have to I, I, some, I, I uh, didn't under, understand. You, to... You're measuring the, the height, right, of these yes. waves. So you have probes there. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if they're invasive, if they are like... Uh, they could spoil the experiment, for instance, but I guess you have some tricks to avoid this interference. I think the, the best, I can give some answer, but I think the best that Felicia answer because it would be... Okay. Yeah, okay. The, the wave gauges are small wires, very thin, only three millimeter in diameter. 
and they are plunged into this basin, which is five meter large. Okay, so they are not invasive at all. No rise. Okay, the, the, the probes are very small and they measure locally at one point the, the wave height that uh, evolves with time and they are not changing the wave field at all. Okay, so, but this is based on your expectations or something that you validated with measurements or? It's like standard that. wave gauges that are used in, in such uh, facilities. Uh, imagine the wavelength is 1.2 meter and, and the size of the gauge is only a few millimeters. So it's very small uh, and, and, and even small compared to the, the wave height. And, but the coupling is, is small as well, I guess. I mean, it's, it's not just Sorry. a matter of size. The coupling has to be small. I, it, it, because if you, if you, for instance, if you place a little stone on, on the skin of a drum, you can, you can change all the spectrum. So the coupling needs to be small. Right? Yeah, so it is. I, I see what you mean. But it's, it's not perturbating the, the, the field. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, I didn't. I didn't g give you uh, uh, all, all the numbers, so I put it uh, here. Number of the uh, wave amplitude and frequencies and all that. Maybe also it can help to to, okay. to figure out how it is. Thank you. We've got some questions in the chat too. I don't know if you can. I'll read the first one um, from Daya. That might be my limitation. I don't understand whether this equation describes the nonlinear motion of liquid on smooth surface or any rough or rugged surface in general. Maybe not so much a question, but a comment. Whether this equation describes ah, it's it describes the at leading order. So this is important. At at leading order, the amplitude, the slow varying amplitude of the wave. Okay. So it's really, I will, I'm sorry, I'm always jumping because I don't see any, anybody when I have the, the slide. So the, this equation, they, they describe for deep water gravity waves, the evolution of the slow varying amplitude. Uh, so it means that A evolves slowly uh, if I compare it to the wavelength, okay? So it describes the, the, the deep gra gravity waves in, in this case. And uh, as you, I, I've shown you quite uh, quantitatively on, on this uh, 140, 20 meters of propagation, okay? Is it clear? Mm -hmm. Yes. And you got to thank you. Okay. And there's another one in the chat from J West four. So how stable are the rogue waves? So if you put a bar across the tank, so that a small segment is shallow. So say like shallow water wave, would the peak survive the passage over the bar? A uh, very interesting question. I don't know. It's a very interesting question. <laughs> Felicia, I think we have to look at that. <laughs> yeah. It's a, I don't know how it uh, easy it is in uh, your water tank to to put some. Uh... It would be feasible to put such a, a, a variation of water depth locally. Uh, we cannot do that on a long distance, but locally that would be uh, possible. My, my guess would be that my guess would be that it's it will not be very stable. Okay, very robust. My guess is that you will you will destroy everything. Uh, you will have small waves, but it's just a guess. Okay. Well, I think it, it depends on the parameter of these of parameters of this perturbation, both smooth, large, and so on. So it could be introduced as a perturbative effect, and then probably it will survive if it is is kind of small and smooth. Uh, it, it depends on, on specific parameters. So. It's clear that it won't survive if you make it very abrupt and, and, and significant. I think. Yeah, because the question was from deep water to shallow water. So. Yeah, but it, you need. I mean, it's 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 very qualitative. Uh, deep water, shallow water. We, we just. So it might survive depending on, on how shallow it is, so to say. Sorry for interruption. No, thank you again. <laughs> Do we have um, any other questions? If 
there's one in the chat from Peter Berg. Experimentally, how would your results change as you vary the wavelength K naught, especially in comparison to the depth of the water? So I don't remember exactly how the, maybe Alexei or Felicia has that in mind. I don't remember all, all the range of parameters that we have tried. What is clear is that if you want to observe a physics that is close to 1D uh, NLS, you need to have a narrow spectrum uh, around your central frequency, okay? So that's the first point. I mean, if you, if you change too much uh, a K naught, it means you change uh, omega naught and your, your spectrum at some point, if you keep the same size for the pulse, uh, you, you will have something that is not described anymore by, by uh, one DNLS, okay? And the high order term will play a, a key, uh, an important role. So that's, that's the first thing I would say. I, I remember that we did different, different tests, not only for this paper, but for, for the papers. And each time the range of, of parameters in which you can uh, work without um, uh, wave breaking, uh, being quite close to 1D NLS uh, uh, physics, it's quite tiny range, okay? And also, yes, so if any of the co-author want to add anything. Yeah, because it was uh, yeah, specified in the, um, in the figure you showed, uh, Pierre, but it's a three meter height here on the 1.2 meter wavelengths. So yeah, it's, uh, let's say, really deep water, yeah. Uh, we have time for maybe one more question. Okay, may I, may I address another question? Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I wonder how generalizable are these results uh, to uh, two dimensions or three dimensions? What is the possible relevance for ocean waves? Tough questions, of course. Yeah, so, it's yeah. Uh, well, with this consortium now we have a funded project and it is one of the questions that we have. It's how, let's say, all, we, we are working now on soliton gas. So how, how the physics of solitons sustain in, in 2D? I mean, what is the transition if you start to have some small directionality? I think a lot of questions are open in, in, in this direction, okay? So it, it's not clear to me. I will never claim that this experiment make, make a rogue wave from ocean, I, I, I mean, it's a kind okay. of pure object, okay, in the, Right. In the lab. So I, it's a good question, but it's an open question. Okay. Thank you. So we've, um, we're just about out of time, but uh, so why don't we thank our speaker again? And if you need to leave, you're um, welcome to, but if there are any last burning questions, and then I'm sure also, uh, please email the authors as well if you have other questions. And, and we can say hello to Amin, who was the first to observe the peregrine soliton uh, in, uh, 10 years ago in water tank. Hello, Amin. <laughs> yeah, hi there. Hi. It's late here, so uh, it, yeah, uh, I will not switch on the, the video. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Much appreciated anyway. Uh, thanks, guys. Thanks. Very nice presentation. Okay, thank you all. Thank you very much.